Hello, it's Susie Walker here from Psychologies Magazine, and I am here with the wonderful Richard Swartz. I'm honoured, actually, Richard, to be talking to you today. You've been in my ear through the whole of lockdown. This is Richard Swartz. He is one of the most acclaimed and respected therapists in the in America. Um, you have your your text on family therapy is one of the most widely used in the states. And I have been personally working with this for the last few months, and I think it's absolutely incredible. Greater than our some parts, which is an audio book um, that you can buy and download. And it seems to have brought everything together, Richard, everything that um, all that my therapy or my spiritual, spiritual beliefs or my coaching and brought it all together. It's fantastic. So first of all, thank you. Well, thank you for your interest, and uh, I'm so glad it's been useful to you. And uh, and you know, from what I know of your publication and your podcast, uh, you do a great service to people of England. So, for people who don't know what you do, let's talk about what is that you know internal family systems. So, internal family systems is what you what have you created? Mm -hmm. Tell tell us a little bit in a nutshell what it is. It's a little hard to do, but the basic ideas are a couple. One is that everybody has what I call parts, which are like little inner personalities that uh, it's the nature of the brain to have, and all of them are valuable. They all have qualities and resources to give us in our lives. But because of our the traumas we suffer and the, what it's called attachment injuries in psychology. Um, they're forced out of their natural valuable state and become extreme often and carry what I'm going to call burdens, which are extreme beliefs and emotions that came into you from these traumas and attach to them almost like, pardon the expression these days, a virus and drive the way they operate. And, uh, so we've all got lots of these parts and many of them in extreme roles because we've all suffered different kinds of traumas. And what I discovered sort of just through trial and error in the early days is that it's possible to help these parts unburden, at which point they'll transform into their naturally valuable states. So this is a model of, of transformation. It's not like become mindful and just accept what's there is actually um, go to these parts with curiosity first and get to know them. And then with compassion as you get to know them. And then in, in this inner world you enter when you do this, you can actually go and hold them and comfort them and learn about where they're stuck in the past and get them out of there so that they no longer, they no longer believe that you're still six years old and you're still being abused or wherever they're stuck. And now they, they know they're safe. And once they're safe, they're willing to give up these extreme beliefs and emotions. Yeah, sure. So that's, that's one of the big assumptions. And I just stumbled onto that. I had no mm -hmm. clue that my clients started teaching this to me and I got curious. The other even bigger assumption, and now it's sort of a proven, is that just beneath the surface of these parts is a kind of essence that has all these wonderful resources that you can access just by getting these parts to open space inside and relax. And when you get into that essence that I call self with a capital S, you begin to heal yourself because that self has all these wonderful qualities we call the eight C's of self-leadership. Yes. Curiosity, confidence, uh, compassion, clarity, calmness, uh, creativity, courage, connect, connectedness. I think I might have left one out, but uh, yeah. that's who you are when we get to it. And then when you get into that state, you can begin to work with these parts on your own, as it sounds like you've been doing from the exercise. Yeah. yeah. And, and, to, and you're right to get to that place where you're um, you're kind of thinking of uh, the different parts of you, whether it's in a child or whether it's in a critic, 
mm-hmm. or you know these different places and then to be able to it's almost like reparenting yourself with this mm-hmm. self Sorry. this compassionate right. courageous heart which has mm-hmm. been for me really incredible to do i mean i've done bits of it in therapy and in mm-hmm. coaching i call it the inner pessimist but i didn't realize there was a whole there were lots and lots of different parts i didn't realize mm-hmm. that i i i recognized some of them like my inner my inner pessimist or my you know inner critic i'd maybe identified some of them but not all of them mm-hmm. and what you've allowed is for me to get to know all of these different parts of myself and as i said to you earlier I found out that I have quite a few positive parts as well. Yeah. You know, I've got one that's really into cell, you know, who'll kind of chibbing me up and say, mm-hmm. come on, let's, you know, sort this out, which has been quite refreshing to find out as well. Um, in terms of connecting to the self, how would we do that? If someone's listening to that now, how would we do that? Well, there are different ways, but the main way I have people do it is, Susie, if we were to work with one of your parts right now, maybe a critic, and yeah. I would have you focus on it and find it in your body. Yeah. And then I would ask you, how do you feel toward this critic? And in answering that question, you're going to tell me how much of yourself is present. So if you hate it, that wouldn't be yourself. It's not one of those C words. Or if you're afraid of it, that wouldn't either. So I would then ask you to see if the part that hates it or is afraid of it could give you a little space in there, just separate a little bit so you could get curious about it and just get to know it. And we would do that until you said, okay, yeah, I am curious about it. I, I feel open to it. And if, and again, depending on your tone of voice and your facial expression, I can kind of tell, okay, now we have enough self to get going. Yeah. And then I would have you ask it some questions. And, you know, you would be often surprised at the answer. I would say, ask it what it's afraid of happen, it would happen if it didn't do this job inside, for example. And I would say, don't think of the answer, just wait for something to come from that place in your body. And you might hear something that was a surprise to you. And then we would negotiate permission to heal what it's protecting. And there's a, you know, a certain kind of steps to actually healing a part. And then come back to the critic and now it's not interested in being a critic anymore. It wants to do something entirely different that's always positive. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing is to give these parts a voice and to have a communication with them, a healthy communication with them is a really breakthrough. Because often when we have an inner critic, what we want to do is turn away from that and to say, shut up, be quiet. I don't want to hear your voice because it's so destructive. Mm -hmm. But realizing what I think for me, the aha in your for me in your work when I was working with it is this idea of that they have a positive message mm, yeah. to give to us, and that they're there for for a reason, um, to protect us or, or or to do something in that. Um, tell us about the other the other part and, and the other piece is about sorry about having compassion for mm-hmm. that part. Yeah, and that sort of fits in with kind of my spiritual beliefs about trying to have compassion for yourself. But sometimes it's difficult to have compassion for yourself per se, but to have compassion for these little parts of yourself. Exactly. When you start have, you know, building compassion for your inner critic, right. it really seems to make a huge difference. Um, yeah. yeah, I, um, again, just stumbled onto that. So going back to that critic, as I got people to get their parts to separate, often spontaneously, whereas seconds earlier they hated it or wanted to get rid of it, I would say, how do you feel toward it now? And I'd they'd say, I just feel sorry for it. I want to help it. I feel bad that it's in this job. And that came out of the blue. I didn't tell them to feel compassion or it's just that that's in the self. And so, you know, many spiritual traditions talk about having to build up the muscle of compassion with lots of practices and exercises. I find mainly you just have to release it. You have to get the parts that are afraid to let you open your heart to get out of the way and then suddenly you have compassion inside and you also have compassion for people around you. Um, And so that's a bit of a radical departure. Uh, Several things are radical. One is the idea that this self is in everybody, can't be damaged and knows how to heal. And then that not only parts like the critic, but I've worked with people who had uh, 
murdered other people, for example, or had molested little kids even, or, you know, so even those parts, when approached from this more mindfully accepting, listening place, will share their secret history of how they were forced into the roles they're in and how um, they hate what they did, but they carry all this, you know, often they carry, those parts carry what I'll call the burden of the energy of the perpetrator. And they have this desire to hurt vulnerability. So as we unburden that, that part also transforms. So yeah. all of this has been a really tough sell over the years because it's so countercultural. But now, you know, thousands of people are using it all over the world and we're all finding the same thing. So yeah. Tell us a little bit about the exile. So that's a, a very yeah. moving part. So when you, yeah. the exile is the part of yourself that you, you I mean, that for me, it was sort of trapped down a well. And yeah. I sort of left it down a well because we weren't going to go there. You know, that yeah. part of me in my childhood that whatever. And it yeah. was left there. And oh sure. my goodness, so dreadful that that poor little being was left down a well. And I had to go and rescue her and then have a conversation with her. I mean... That is, again, that feels to be very radical in terms of... Yeah. You know, yeah, that's amazing you could do that by yourself. A lot of people can't, but... I have been in therapy for years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, but yes, so when bad things happen to us when we were young, there we, you know, we're born with these inner children, people call them, and before they get hurt or shamed or terrified, they're, we love them. They're, they give us all the this liveliness and playfulness and intimacy-seeking behavior and uh, awe at the world and so and on. Joy and joy. Oh, exactly. But after they get hurt, now they carry the burden of emotional pain or or worthlessness or betrayal or whatever it is or terror. And now we don't realize that they're little inner hurt children. We think that, that it's just the memory, sensations, emotions, and beliefs from the trauma that we want to get away from and move on from. And I don't know about England, but in the U.S., that's a big theme. It's just move on. Don't look back. Yeah. You know, you have the stiff upper lip. Yeah, well, we just keep it all down. You right, know, right. We're well, never going to go there again. Forget it. What, exactly. That's what keeping it all down means, is exiling these parts that got hurt and trying to throw away the key. And like you said, put them in inner wells or abysses or caves or basements. And once you get a bunch of these exiles, life becomes more dangerous and you become more delicate. And so you, you have to have other parts jump into roles to protect you. And some of them try to manage your life so that you never get triggered your exiles never get triggered. And so they'll manage your relationships so you never get close to anybody or the people you depend on don't get too distant or they'll manage your appearance so you don't get rejected or your performance so you get accolades. So we call them the managers. And in other systems, they'd be the defenses. Yeah. But the world has a way of breaking through those defenses and triggering your exiles at which point it's like this explosion of flames of emotion are going to consume you and you feel overwhelmed and and terrified. You feel like one of those little ch children, in your case, girls, I assume. Yeah, yeah. And, and that kind of vulnerability piece. Yeah, you, all, you feel like, terribly so vulnerable. Like literally, you, you feel uh, as if you, you're kind of naked and, and exactly. you know, alone. It's horrendous. That's and right. I suppose, and, and I suppose, you've tried to protect yourself That's right. um, as much as you possibly can. And then to, to go and get your, your, that little person, it's so, it's quite, it was quite a reunion in my, in my world. It was, it was beautiful. It was amazing, but it was really moving as well to yeah. have that sense and to kind of bring her back, you know, yeah. into the real yeah. world. It was amazing. So that is the work. And it's amazing. Like I said, that you can do it that well by yourself. And, it's also possible, as I was saying, once you get her out of that well and, and she's with you now, yeah. you, can, you can ask her if she wants to unload the feelings and beliefs she got back there. Yes. And 
as she trusts you, she's she's going to be willing to do that. So yeah. there's a whole kind of ritual for yeah. pushing that stuff out of your body and, and uh, giving it away, at which point she just transforms into a happy little inner child. Yes. And and, and, and what I love about what the, the, the system is about, trans, as you keep saying, transformation. So mm -hmm. a lot of the work that we do at Psychology is about mindfulness and self-awareness and noticing, mm -hmm. which, again, is so useful because so that you have that kind of background but what we're doing is going in and and then literally when you talk to them and have compassion to them some kind of magic happens but the, for me the most the most amazing thing is to be in to find this kind of self this courageous compassionate mm -hmm. self which yeah. is this what the buddhists say really it's like there is this you can get back to center and then when mm -hmm. you find that place that centered place mm -hmm. it's um well, it's kind of what I've been looking for. So this is why I love your work. You know, I've just discovered it, and I'm like, wow, this brings everything together. <laughs> so I'm so enthusiastic about it. We're gonna we're gonna commission a dossier on it in the, later in the year. So we're gonna come back to you with one of our senior journalists to interview you. I just wanted to say I'm so thrilled to be speaking to you. <laughs> I really am. Thank you so so much. For Thank you so much, there. Susan. Yeah, we're gonna, beam, we're gonna beam this interview out to as many people as we can. We're gonna do a dossier on it. I want as many people to know about your work. But in the meantime. If you need to, the greater than our some parts, it's an audio book that's currently available. Um, so do download it and start working through it. And I, I truly think it's it's one of the most transformational kind of programs that you could probably undertake, especially at this moment. So that's thank great. you. Thank you, Susan. So thank much. you very much. And I'll great speak to you soon. You. Bye bye. Okay. Bye.